Okay. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity in as many ways possible that you are a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity, right? So you're put where you were put. You grew up where you grew up because you was black. No other reason. So for those in the Nickerson Gardens, you're in the Nickerson Gardens because you was black. For those in the Jordan Down Projects, you're in the Jordan Down Projects because you was black. For those in the jungles, you are in those jungles because you were black. And not only because you're black, but you're also expected because you're black to make peace with the projects, right? To not see a world beyond those project walls, right? He said, this is a part of the problem I have with my country, right? You're placed in East Los Angeles because of your indigenous status, right? You're off of greed and Soto because of that our indigenous status and nothing more, right? This is the problem that Baldwin is having with this country and his countrymen. He says, the details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you. Now, here we have the, um, the presence of the second pillar of white inferiority, the white imagination, right? Because they imagine the symbols. They imagine the details that make you understand blackness in a way that is situated as inferior, right? There's, other, there's another interview with Baldwin and he is responding to a question and he says in response to the question, I'm not a nigga, right? So the real question, if I'm not a nigga, the real question becomes, why do you, i.e. the white world, need to create a nigga in the first place? Why is that necessary? Why does your imagination have to create these symbols and these details, i.e. a nigga, just for you to feel comfortable, right? And then, um, I believe it was Giovanni who was saying uh, this, he spoke on this, you know. Actually, no, I'm sorry, it was Jessica. Uh, you must accept them with love. For these innocent people have no other hope. Again, love as that rectifying force love as love as that means for survival right for these innocent people have no other ho hope they are in effect still trapped in a history that they do not understand they cannot be released from it until they understand it right so the reason ball um love becomes quintessential for baldwin right is because he realizes that the white world, the dominant world, will not come to terms on their own with their atrocities. They have constructed the world in a way that allows them to avoid having that moment of truth, so to speak. So this gets to um, how Baldwin understands this notion of love, okay? So again, and I think I mentioned this last week, but it's not this romantic, we're gonna get together and make mixed children love, right? It's not, it's not what he's interested in. He's in a, interested in a love that's going to tell you the truth about yourself, the uncomfortable truth, right? The, the truth that's going to make you kind of squirm in your chair, right? And I think I also mentioned last week when Baldwin writes love in his novels, he uses reflections to do so, right? Mirrors, windows, rivers, oceans, etc. all things that will reflect back, he uses this as a means to kind of highlight this level of what the work love should be doing, right? So if you think about a mirror, you about to go out for the weekend, right? You, you went online, you did your shopping and, and you have an idea of what your outfit's gonna look like for the weekend or for the evening. But you're not gonna leave the house without checking to see that your outfit is on point, right? So what you gonna do? You're gonna go to the mirror. The mirror's gonna be like, yo, that shirt kinda small, homie. You know, uh, you need to get a bigger size shirt. Your shit is wrinkled, homie, you need to fix that, right? That mirror is gonna allow you to kind of iron out some of the things that you may have missed. And this is the work that Baldwin says love should do. It should tell you when you are wrong, right? He also mentions in the text, um, white folks in this terms of like our little brothers, our younger brothers who we must love, right? I'm a oldest brother of two younger brothers. So I understand that, that um, the comparison. And I know with my younger brothers, if they were to be doing something that would cause harm to another individual, right? 
it would be my task as the older brother to check them on that, right? And not to check them only because of the people who they're harming, but to check them for their own benefit, right? So this is the work that love should do, according to Baldwin. And, and, and I agree with Jessica, right? That's, that's a very difficult ask to make of a people who's been through all that we've been through. But let me get to this point. Keep in mind, this book was published in 1963. Historical context is important, right? Because what's going on in early 1960s, the civil rights movement, right? And one of the main thrusts of the civil rights movement is this idea of integration, this idea of nonviolence, right? So integration says, well, we want to live where white folks want to go to school with white folks who want to be able to, you know, socialize as one nation, as an American nation, right? So this is part of the conversation that's going on in the civil rights movement. Dr. King, um, SCLC, and all these organizations, right? But on the other side is groups like the Nation of Islam, groups that take on more black nationalist ideologies, individuals like Malcolm X, who says, you know what, y'all can have that integration. What we want is separation. So give us some states in the American South and we'll make our own black nation within America. Give us our 40 acres and a mule and we don't need y'all, we'll do, by, we'll do by ourselves, right? So these are two ideologies that are taking shape within the black community in the, in the 60s. And Baldwin is watching and Baldwin is in, in, in contact with both of these groups. Because in the second essay, he talks about a meeting that he has with Elijah Muhammad, who is the um, leader of the Nation of Islam, right? And they discuss strategies. And Baldwin kind of points some holes in some of the strategies of the Nation of Islam. But I just bring this up to let you guys know that he's familiar with both camps, okay? This book is entitled The Fire Next Time, which is a biblical reference. Biblical reference dealing with the story of Noah. Who knows the um, the biblical story of Noah? Anybody familiar? Okay, so the story with Noah. God is watching humanity fuck up, right? And he's getting sick of the way that humans are performing. So he's like, you know what? I'm getting rid of all y'all. Y'all tripping? I'm going to flood this shit and it's going to be a wrap. But what I will do, because I'm not a cruel guy, right? I'm going to talk to my homie Noah, who was one of my favorite faithful servants. I'm going to tell him, build a boat. Once you build this boat, get two of every animals, get your family together, put, on this, put them on this boat, and you will be tasked to repopulate humanity, right? So that's the story of Noah. And this is how Baldwin ends the book. Not what you guys read, but the entire book, The Fire Next Time. If we... And now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the others. Do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible in a song by, the, by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time, right? So he flooded the, he, he ended his humanity the first time with the floods. So God warned Noah, yo, I'm letting you be the one to restart humanity. Right? That's why I'm telling you to build this boat and get your folks on this boat so you can repopulate humanity. But Noah, you fuck this up. No more water, homie. I'm burning this shit down. Right? So no more water. It's the fire next time. So Baldwin is thinking about what's going on in the civil rights movement in the 1963. I see this nonviolent movement that's being ignored, right? I see that even the people in the nonviolent movement like Dr. like Dr. King, like Megger Evers, et cetera, et cetera, are dying violently at the hands of the oppressor, right? I also know that there's other faction, 
these black Muslims who aren't so nonviolent, who aren't so patient, right? And I know in the North, because he's from New York, folks is listening to what the Nation of Islam is saying, right? So if America, if you don't get this shit together, no more water sign. It's going to be fire next time, right? So not only does this book serve as pedagogy, not only does it serve as a mechanism for teaching generational survival, it's a book of prophecy, right? If you don't get this racial situation under control, America, the fire's coming. And when we pick back up after our midterm, you'll see how Baldwin's prophecy comes to fulfillment. And you'll see how um, the work of Malcolm X kind of picks up on this prophetic message as well. Um, I will end my notes there. We'll transition into our fishbowl. So remember, for the fishbowl, you have to go twice a semester. Um, it can be something that was discussed in my notes. You can discuss the video I played. Um, you can discuss your breakout rooms or your journal, all that's on the table. Um, you have one time to pass. Is there any volunteers for the fishbowl? I'll go. Okay, Ryan, I got you. And I go as well. I'm um, sorry, who's the second person? Maxwell. Maxwell, okay, I got Ryan and Maxwell. I'd also like to go. Elizabeth, okay. Uh, that'll be the three we got for today. So we have Ryan, Maxwell, and Elizabeth. And what I'll try to do uh, by the midterms is send out a list of who's went on the fishbowl, who's went twice, and who's winning all. So that way you guys kind of know where you're at for the um, semester. Um, so whoever wants to set it off, it's on you. One of the uh, crazy things I got from the uh, reading was it says that this innocent country sets you down in the ghetto in which, in fact, it attends that you should perish. And it was kind of crazy to me because I asked my granny one time, uh, like, what was the best thing that's ever happened to you? And she was like, I don't know, but like just seeing all her grandkids still alive and like she knows that you know, this world is so crazy that something could happen to us at any age. So, like, that's the best thing that's ever happened to you. So it just made me be like, you know, whatever you want to do, do it. Because, you know, we're not expected to be on this earth for that long. So you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. In spite of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Maxwell or Elizabeth? Um, so... Referring back to your notes, uh, the quote that you were talking about, uh, this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen, and for which neither I nor time nor history will ever forgive them that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. Um, I feel like here he's emphasizing to his nephew uh, the act that the country and countrymen have like they have caused uh, will never and should never be forgiven for. And uh, the countrymen know what they're doing but they don't want to like acknowledge that what they're doing is wrong you know yeah yeah that's a great call out maxwell because we know that he goes from there to talking about how it's the innocence which constitutes the crime absolutely uh, elizabeth um going on from what maxwell said i agree like how in this reading he almost explains that white people have a privilege to ignore and not acknowledge what has been done in the past and until like it says, they're trapped in history, which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released, released from it. It's saying like, until white people acknowledge their privilege and the struggles people of color have to go through, then actual change can start. Yeah. World, I think he calls it uh, world changing change, something like that. Yeah. So. I would like to, if possible, um, pick back up on a statement that Jessica made. Um, she says this notion of, of love and loving those who have oppressed you, it's a hard, it's a hard ask, right? Um, and for me, one of the things I look at this dynamics is, is similar to me to an abusive relationship, right? And there's a couple of things that you could do when you're in an abusive relationship. You could stay and continue to get abused. Um, you could leave the abuse or you could fight back, right? 
Um, another analogy could be used is, is a bully, right? A playground bully. Take your lunch money, take your, snoop, your shoes, right? In my experiences, especially if you, if you use the, the, the bully analogy, I haven't been in an abusive relationship, so I can't speak to that. But in my experiences, when dealing with the bully, oftentimes what gets the bully off of you is punching that motherfucker in the mouth, right? Whether you lose the fight or not, but just the fact that you're willing to defend yourself typically changes the way that they interact with you. Here we have Baldwin saying we must love them in spite of themselves right because that's the only hope that this world has i agree with jessica that's a large task but is that the right approach is my question to you all right is the and again keep in mind the type of love baldwin's talking about does not think about this in a romantic sense right but the patience the determination right that was required, that would be required to show these type of people that have been treating you this way, i.e. bullies, i.e. abusers, i.e. rapists, right? The patience that is determined to show them themselves at the way that Baldwin seeks to do, is that reasonable? Is that a good approach to addressing the grievances of Black oppression? Amir? Um, I I agree with, I agree with him and the type of patience and the type of love that he's saying that we need. And I feel like that for quite some time. I feel like that that's the only way to really move forward because we have to. I understand like we got to understand what they did is bad, and the white people first they got to acknowledge that first. That's their biggest issue. But once they realize and they can acknowledge that, I feel like if we have the the in it, if we have it in our heart to forgive them, we can finally move forward and forget the the race divide that's there altogether. Cause if I'm not mistaken, that's what it, that's really what this is all about. We just want equality. We all want to be on the equal field. And for us to all be on the equal field, there's gotta be no more racism or no more prejudice or any type of things like that coming from both ways. And that's how I feel. So I do agree with him on the aspect of we, we have to have patience with them. Anybody else want to chime in? Anybody else agree, disagree or feel indifferent? No, no one has any thoughts on this. Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. Um, I, I agree. Um, I, I mean, I get it. I feel like it's like, um, you know, black people are being the bigger people in a sense, you know, they're, they're doing that at the same time. I wonder if being that way, if like responding with love, does it kind of like, I don't know, does it, does it make it okay? Do they feel like, oh, okay, well, they're gonna, you know, respect us anyway. So let's just continue on you know, with what we're doing. Like, I don't know, it's just, it's a little weird for me, <laughs> like that whole situation. So I, I hear you, Jessica, it's kind of like um, the old Wu Tang's uh, lyric, turn the other cheek and I'll break your fucking chin, right? And that's what continues to happen. We'll turn the other cheek because that's what Jesus says and we continue to get punched on the other side of our face. Um, is anybody familiar with Botham, Botham John? Anybody, that name sound familiar to anybody? Botham John. Anybody, the name Amber Geiger sound familiar to anyone? Both them, John, Amber Geiger, Texas, no? Okay, um, so maybe two years ago, there was an incident in Dallas, Texas, in an apartment complex where Amber Geiger, a police officer at the time, um, came home from her shift and uh, goes to the wrong floor of her apartment complex. On the inside of the apartment is Botham John. He's sitting there eating ice cream, watching TV. Here's some um, fumbling at the door. The door is pushed open. In walks Amber Geiger, pistol drawn. Botham John gets up out of his couch. Bop, 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 bop. Botham John is killed, right? She goes to the wrong apartment complex. She thought he broke into her home, okay? Never mind the fact that the whole setup of the apartment on the inside looks different. Never mind the fact that he had a carpet in front of his door. She doesn't, right? Never mind the fact that when you walk through the hallways, they have numbers that say level five, 
level four, etc. Right. So all these things, all these cues, she missed. At the time, I was in Dallas, Texas, watch uh, visiting my brother, and I'm watching the trial. Right. And I'm like, oh shit, we got a, a black judge. This may be different outcome. Let's see how this pans out. And to her credit, the judge. She kept her shit under composure. They tried all the little loopholes that they typically try to get Amber Geiger um, acquitted or released. Uh, they really talked about her character as an upstanding individual, yada, 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 right? And then they do the job of painting both from John, right? This religious individual, um, the neighbor said every Sunday morning when he woke up, he would hear both of John singing his um, Christian songs. Uh, he was a missionary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Verdict comes. She gets guilty. I'm like, oh, shit. They gave her, they got her the, on the guilty. This black judge, hey. But the minimal sentence that they could give her possible, right? The, the least, I think she's, I think it was like a five year sentence is what they gave her with chance of early parole. I'm like, what the fuck? Five years, but it's guilty, right? At the end of the trial, at the end of the verdict and everything, the judge hands Amber Geiger a Bible, gives her a hug and tells her, I'll pray for you. One, to me, that's unprofessional, right? If you're a, I have never seen a judge ever interact with someone who's guilty or not guilty. I've never seen that type of interaction, right? But not only do you give her a Bible, not only do you address her, right? You give her a Bible and you give her a hug and tell her I'm praying for you. We get to both of John's family. All of them forgive her. All of them pray for her soul, right? So for me watching this, this idea of forgiveness, this idea of bigger being the bigger person, it makes me kind of feel the way that Jessica feel. This is perpetuating the cycle. Subliminally, you're saying that it's okay. I'm not even mad enough about my son, about my brother, about my cousin being gone my religion won't allow me to be upset about this. My religion is going to force me to forgive you, right? And I can't help but to think how we got this understanding of religion, right? Because not all Christians move like that, right? If you look out throughout history, if there, 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 there are crusades, right? So if there's a crusade to advance Christianity, you cannot think that we're moving from this space of forgiveness, right? Because to move something forward in the space of crusade, what are you doing? You're going to war, right? You're murdering, right? So it's interesting how black Christians really hold steadfast to this notion of forgiveness, these ideas of turning the other cheek. This book was written in 1963. Same shit is going on in 2021. What has been consistent from 1963 to 2021 is the oppressed turn the other cheek, the oppressed being the bigger person, the oppressed trying to be patient, the oppressed trying to understand. And through all of that, the situation remains the same. So is that the appropriate tactic? Are there other alternatives to addressing our situation and our plight? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Nobody? I think it goes back to like talking about a bully. Like it doesn't stop until you defend yourself. Like it's just kind of as simple as that, I think. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Jessica. I, I have to say, in my experience, personally, um, in reading history, right? Not only African history, world history, 
right? That power only respects one thing. What's the one thing that power respects? Does anyone know? Money. Uh, that's a kind of, kind of. What, what, what is, well, let me ask you this then. If it's money, what does money give you? Power. Okay, got you. <laughs> yep. Only thing that power respects is power. More power, right? So if we ain't talking about a love that's dealt in power, we ain't talking about shit. If we're not talking about a forgiveness that's dealing with power, you ain't talking about shit, right? And, and I'm going to leave this here because this is what we'll transition into when we return from our um, midterms. This is where black folks transition into once they see uh, Malcolm go, once they see Martin go, right? They get tired. You can only do so much for so long. It makes me think about this um, Tupac interview with MTV. I think it was in 93. And, and she's asking him about the evolution of gangster rap and hip hop, right? And for those you who may not know, it's st hip hop starts off as a very um, conscious community mechanism to express ourselves, right? And then it takes this turn where it gets a little bit more violent because it serves as a, um, a, a ghetto report card, right? They're gonna report what's happening on the streets. And this is the time, these, these, early, these early 90s is this time where they're really reporting the happenings of the streets. And the um, reporter asked Pac, why has it turned so violent, right? And he says, well, let's just say that we're all homeless and y'all all live in this hotel, right? And in this hotel, you got all kind of food, y'all feasting, salami flying, meat moving, right? Everybody eating. You'll go that first time like, yo, excuse me, we're hungry out here. Can we get something to eat? Y'all shut the door on us, right? Months go by. Excuse me, you're hungry. Shut the door on us, right? Years go by. Yo, we hungry. Shut the door on us, right? By that fifth year, we're not knocking no more. We kicking the door and blasting is what Pac says. Because you've been not listening to us so much that you left us no other choice. And that frustration is echoed within the black community in the late 60s and the early 70s when you shift from civil rights to black power. Um, this shift is what I'll be talking about tomorrow at Antioch, which is your um, extra credit opportunity. Um, again, once we get back from our midterms, we'll dive a little bit deeper in this, looking at um, Martin Luther King, looking at Malcolm X, and then looking at the actual black power movement, in particular, Huey P. Newton and Stokely Carmichael. Um, so. There is no readings for this week. Um, either tomorrow or Friday, I will email you out your midterm study guide. Um, and then what we'll do next Wednesday, we'll spend the whole day going through that. And like I mentioned that following Thursday, I will send out the midterm and you'll have to get that to me by uh, Monday. Uh, Jessica, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry, that was an accident. <laughs> okay, all good, all good. Um, anyone else have any questions, comments, or concerns? What we'll also do next week is go through how many journal entries you should have. So that way you'll know how many should be submitted to me, I believe on the 2nd of November. Um, and then, yeah, we'll take it from there. Other than that, if no one has any further questions, you guys be healthy, be well, be wise, and I'll see you next week. Peace. You're welcome, Bridget. You're welcome, Jessica. Khalil, you good, man? Khalil, you all right?